Hello everyone, I am Muhammad Eskin, and in this talk I'm going to present our PKC 2022 paper. And in this work, uh, we introduce a new cryptography primitive that we call verifiable partial decryptable commitments. And we have an instantiation of this primitive from lattices, and we have an application of this lattice-based instantiation in the blockchain private uh, payment setting. And this is a joint work with Ron Steinfeld and Raymond Saw from Monash University. Okay, so let me start with the outline. So I'm first going to talk about these two uh, features of account uh, accountability and auditability, which are the motivations uh, for the introduction of this primitive that I mentioned before. And I'm going to very briefly talk about the commitment schemes and non-interactive zero knowledge proofs, or NISC proofs for short. This will be a very brief discussion. And I'm going to introduce this new primitive that we uh, abbreviate as VPDC. And then I'm going to talk about our lattice based instantiation. So, our instantiation is based on a commonly used lattice based commitment scheme that we call hashed message commitment. And then finally, I'll talk about our application uh, in this uh, private blockchain uh, payment setting where we construct an auditable uh, protocol that we call Matrix AU. Okay, yeah, I'm sure everyone knows what a multi-party protocol is, but just to recap, so we have a bunch of parties. In this simplest setting, we have two parties, Alice and Bob. So in this multi-party protocol, they might be exchanging some messages, they might run some uh, internal computations, and then maybe at the end of the protocol, they might output uh, some messages. Okay, and here, as you can see, like Alice knows who Bob is, Bob knows who Alice is, and everyone else can see the exchange messages and can also see who is exchanging these messages. Okay. But of course, from a cryptographic perspective, this is not very desirable because we are, you might be leaking out of secret information, for example, M0, M1, and so on, might be containing some secret information or leaking the user identities that are involved in the protocol might also be not desirable. And from a cryptographic point of view, we often want uh, what's called a privacy preserving protocol. Okay. So in this setting, we again have Alice and Bob, but they kind of uh, have a kind of like a shield, a cryptographic shield that protects their identities from the outside world, or they may also not even know uh, each other's identities. And uh, also the messages that are encrypted, uh, sorry, the messages that are exchanged between Alice and Bob, they are also somehow hidden from the outside world. Okay. And to achieve these uh, privacy goals, there are common tools uh, employed, such as commitment schemes, zero-knowledge proofs, encryption schemes, and so on. But uh, even though this setting of privacy prison protocols are very desirable from a cryptographic perspective, it also leads to issues in practice. And in particular, for example, Bob may be malicious, and he might be actually exploiting this uh, privacy features to hide, for example, his illegal activities. Okay, what could it be? For example, just a simple example. So he might, for example, be injecting Alice's computer with a ransomware, and he might be asking for a ransom, say something like, uh, "Pay me one million dollars in Monero, or I'm going to destroy all of your files." Okay, and Monero is a privacy preserving cryptocurrency protocol where the user identities and the transaction history is hidden from the rest of the world. Okay, so to hide his, for example, illegal financial activities, uh, Bob, who is the adversary in this case, might be exploiting this privacy features that are uh, used in the Monero cryptocurrency. And we actually already know that uh, this is happening uh, with many cryptocurrencies that are used today. Okay, so to kind of circumvent this problem uh, in practical applications, what we may actually want is an auditable privacy preserving protocol where we are going to introduce this uh, authority into the picture. Okay. Now, this authority will have special powers, and in particular, uh, he will be able to kind of break through this anonymity shield, and he will be able to say, oh, okay, that, that's actually Bob who is misbehaving or who is uh, kind of conducting some illegal transactions. Okay. 
and in particular, this authority uh, will have a secret trapdoor and will use that trapdoor to be able to kind of break this anonymity or privacy features that are employed in the protocol. Okay. And this authority might also be able to see the exchange messages. Uh, so he might do either or uh, both of them together. Okay. And it's important to note here that only the authority is able to do this and the ordinary users cannot actually break the anonymity or the confidentiality of the protocol. Okay. And there are actually many examples where this accountability or auditability feature is needed. So I already mentioned about blockchain and cryptocurrency protocols, and this is the application that we focus on in this work. There are also already cryptographic schemes that have this anonymity, sorry, that have this accountable uh, anonymity feature already inside them, such as like accountable ring signatures and group signatures. And there are further higher level protocols like fair exchange, e-voting and so on, where we would want this accountability or auditability feature. Okay. And many existing protocols are actually built on these commitment schemes that I already mentioned that is used to hide secret protocol information. And uh, usually these commitment schemes have a compression feature and they don't have a decryption feature in general, okay, which uh, stems from the compression. Okay, so I, by default, there is no way to recover partial secret information, even if you want to have this or uh, enable this auditability or accountability feature that I mentioned before, because you cannot, I mean, you, once, the, once you commit to something, you cannot actually reveal some secret information about that uh, due to the lack of this decryption feature. Okay. Of course, we do know a primitive that has a decryption feature, which is an encryption scheme. And why don't we just switch to an encryption? And the main reason, so there are, there are multiple reasons, but I'm just going to mention the main one here, uh, is because many existing protocols require commitment to a very long uh, auxiliary message that is actually not necessary to be recovered in decryption. Okay, so if you want to switch to an encryption, this will mean that you will need to encrypt a very long high entropy message using an encryption scheme, which you can, which cannot provide a compression, and this will lead to a significant communication overhead. Okay. And this is precisely the problem that we are trying to solve in our work. And our goal is to enable partial decryption in a verifiable manner. Okay. And this one, we will be decrypting, partial decrypting a commitment scheme and not switching to a full encryption. Okay, and verifiable in this setting means uh, very similar to this verifiable encryption that you may have heard of, which basically says that users cannot just simply uh, avoid decryption because we will ask them to kind of prove that the commitments are well formed, and then the decryptors will always be will always be able to decrypt a verifiably encrypt verifiably committed message. Okay. Okay, so let me then summarize our contributions in this work. So as I mentioned, we first formalize this VPDC notion, verifiable partially decryptable commitments notion. So this is an extension of a commitment scheme that has a matching NIST proof, and we want to provide partial decryption. And then uh, we have generalized analysis of decryption feasibility for relaxed uh, NIST proofs. So I'm not really going to talk too much about what a relaxed proof is or what an exact proof is, uh, but our results uh, uh, are built upon uh, results from Lubashevsky and Nevan from Eurocrypt 17. And effectively, what our results say is a kind of like a lifting theorem that says that if you can decrypt in the non-relaxed case, then you can also extend this to the relaxed uh, case. And this result applies to a wide class of fiat shamir protocols. And then the next thing, which is kind of like one of the core parts of our paper, is a novel decryption for this lattice-based commitment scheme that I mentioned before, hashed message commitment. And here we will be utilizing a gadget vector to enable a regex type decryption in this uh, compression, in this commitment scheme where compression happens. And then finally, I'll talk about, uh, oh, pardon, sorry, the final part of our paper is about an application in this so-called ring CT approach that is employed by Monero cryptocurrency. 
and uh, this will be the introduction of matrix AU that extends this matrix protocol from uh, CCS 2019. Okay. So in this talk, I'm not going to talk about relaxed proofs and uh, I'm not going to talk about, therefore, the generalized uh, decryption feasibility results and I'm, I'm going to refer you to the paper for that. Okay, so let's uh, discuss a bit about this VPDC primitive. Uh, this will be an informal discussion. So let's start with an ordinary commitment scheme and quickly recall how it works. So it has three functions, a key jam function that outputs a commitment key. We can commit to messages where this commit function outputs a commitment capital C along with an opening of this commitment that we call O. And then we have an open function that checks whether an uh, opening is valid uh, for a commitment or not. Okay. And then two core properties of a commitment scheme is binding and hiding. So binding basically says that you cannot uh, open the commitment with two distinct messages. So this is computationally hard. And hiding basically means that the commitment does not leak information uh, about the committed message. Okay. And in many protocols, we also want a homomorphism property, which says that we have these two operations, multiplication and addition, so this is O plus and O times, where we can take a scalar alpha and then two commitments C1 and C2. We can compute alpha times C1 plus C2, and we want this to be equal to the uh, commitment of alpha times the message of the first commitment M1 plus the message of the second commitment M2. Okay, so these are the standard uh, things or common things for commitment schemes. So I'm not really going to talk about or define uh, these proofs and uh, non-interactive zero knowledge proofs, and we are basically just going to assume uh, the existing existence of a matching NISC for the relation that is given here, and this relation is a standard commitment opening relation that says that the prover knows an opening O for a given public commitment C such that uh, C and O, when given as an input to the C open function, returns uh, true. Okay. Uh, so this is a very standard NISC proof. And this NISC will satisfy the standard properties of completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge. Okay. Let's now really look into how we now extend the commitment scheme to the VPDC. Okay. So as I mentioned, we will assume that there is a matching NISC. Uh, that's accompanying the commitment scheme. And we will actually, as a first step, we'll be splitting the message space of the commitment scheme into two parts. So M will be a product of D and U, capital D and U. And D will be denoting the decryptable message space, where U will denote non-decryptable or the auxiliary message space. Okay. And as I mentioned before, in many practical uh, protocols, the entropy of the this U space, this auxiliary message space, is much higher than the entropy of the decryptable part where you want to recover uh, in decryption. Okay. So as an additional function, we will have an add trapdoor function, which will basically just take a commitment scheme and embed a trapdoor into it. And then we will of course have a decryption function which will partially decrypt the commitment given commitment C to recover a message in this D space, okay? So it's only a subset of M, so and we are not recovering the full message of the commitment scheme, but we are just recovering a part or a portion of the full input message, okay? So this partial decryption as opposed to full decryption is really a feature in this setting and not a drawback that will allow us to compress the auxiliary message part, okay? Because we all know that if you compress the message, then we cannot fully recover that in decryption. Okay. So that's why we will get both compression as well as decryptability in a single primitive. Okay. Let's now look at the actual properties of a VPDC. Okay. So we will first have a succinctness, which will say that the bit length of the commitment scheme, so a commitment output, will only depend on the bit length of the auxiliary message in a polylogarithmic fashion. Okay. So it will not grow linearly with the bit length of the auxiliary message. Okay. 
And this is literally the main property that distinguishes VPDC from a verifiable encryption or a proof of plain text knowledge, if you know them, because in an encryption setting, so these two things, verifiable encryption and proof of plain text knowledge, are built upon encryption schemes, which means that you cannot get uh, this succinct notion, even for the auxiliary message, if you want to do it, because uh, you cannot uh, compress the uh, message at all in the encryption case. And then we have this, what we call a small integer dictator message space property, which basically says that this D space that we defined before, this dictator message space, will basically just consist of integers. Okay? And this is really the case for our application, and that's why we are introducing this property, and we actually have more generalized decryption. We show in the paper that it's actually possible even with, without uh, this restriction. Okay? And then we have this key indistinguishable property, which says that a trapdoor commitment key is uh, computationally indistinguishable from an ordinary commitment, scheme, commitment key of the commitment scheme. And then we have a stronger binding property that we call trapdoor binding, which says that even when the adversary is given access to the trapdoor, still the binding property holds with respect to the trapdoor commitment key. Okay? And this is really important for our application because we really want that authorities not be cheating in the protocol. Okay, so we prevent authorities from cheating, even though they have access to the trapdoor. And then we have a decryption soundness property, which kind of effectively says that decryption function returns the same message used to construct the commitment. And then we have a decryption feasibility property that uh, roughly says that the decryption function runs in reasonable time. Okay. Again, since I'm not talking about this relaxed zero-knowledge proofs in this talk, this notion of reasonable, it will be vague in this talk, and I'll refer you to the paper for the concrete definition for that. But just know that in the case of relaxed proofs, there are further complications arising, and we, solve, we show how to solve them in, in our paper that you can have a look at. Okay, so let's now see how we construct this VPDC primitive from lattices, and we will be building upon this HMC commitment scheme. So let's first look at how HMC works. So we have two matrices, two random public matrices, or a polynomial ring that we denote by RQ with a variable x. Okay. If you want to commit to a message m, which needs to have small coefficients, then we are going to sample a randomness with again small coefficients and just compute a times r plus b times m, and this output mod q will be equal to uh, the commitment. Okay? So this is, as I mentioned, is a very standard commitment scheme used in many lattice space protocols, and its security can be easily shown from module sys and module LWE problems. Okay? And as the first step, so this picture, as you might see, doesn't fully capture our setting in the VPDC where we split the message into two parts. So to make it more clear, we will slightly shift the view and we will split this B matrix into two parts, B and C, and also this message into M and U. Okay, so M will be a decryptable message, which uh, often has very low entropy, and this uh, U will be the auxiliary message, which often has very high entropy. Okay, but still, randomness, decryptable message, and auxiliary message, they all have small coefficients. Okay. And there are already existing standard opening proofs for this HMC commitment, so we don't need to uh, construct them from scratch. Okay. So they are kind of like very standard uh, protocols. Okay, so first we need to add a trapdoor into the commitment key, and let's see how we do this. So first we are going to assume for the simplicity in this talk, that M is just a bunch of bits, okay? This M uh, matrix, sorry, M vector that we want to recover in the encryption, okay? So this U part, the auxiliary part, can have much more entropy, so it doesn't have to be binary, but the decryptable one, we are for now assuming that it's binary. Okay, in the paper, we also show a generalization where M is not necessarily binary. Okay, so for trapdoor uh, embedding, we are going to update the last rows of these A, B, C matrices. Okay, so let's assume that A prime, B prime, and C prime 
are the parts of ABC where the last rows are removed. Okay, and the last rows we are going to uh, kind of generate them in a specific manner. Okay, and in particular, they will just be uh, LWE uh, vectors. Okay, in particular, we take the matrix, this random matrix uh, A prime, multiply it with a secret vector S prime, and then we add some noise. Okay, in particular for V0, we add E0, and then we add E1, and then E2 for the other. Okay, but with only one difference, where the second one, this W1, will also have this additional term, that is T bar times a gadget vector G. Okay, so T bar is this parameter that's also used in Regev uh, encryption, which is Q divided by T for a parameter T that defines the uh, message space. Okay, and this, this gadget vector is this power of two vector, like one, two, four, up to a power of two, and then x, two x, four x, and so on. Okay, since we are working over a polynomial ring, we have this uh, multiplication by x, and x squared, x cubed, and so on. Okay, so this t bar times g part will be important for us, so that will allow us to recover the message. So if you are a bit confused with this picture, don't worry about it. So what we really want to do is to set a trapdoor S, which will just be simply this uh, minus S prime, that is the secret for the LWE, concatenate with one. Okay, so that's the trapdoor full S. And we just want that S times this trapdoor commitment key is almost equal to or approximately equal to a bunch of zeros for the first part, and then T bar times G for the second part and then followed by zeros again, okay? So that the randomness gets multiplied by zeros, the message gets multiplied by the gadget vector, and then again, the auxiliary message gets multiplied by zeros as well, roughly, okay? So this is how we embed the trapdoor into the commitment key. And then let's now see how we do the decryption. If we now have a commitment, let's say H, under a trapdoor commitment key, and if we multiply this commitment, or we compute an inner product of this commitment with S, then we are going to get, so as we just showed before, so in this, oops, sorry, in this picture here, so we will see that this A and C parts will be canceled out, and they will just contribute to an error term, which will have small coefficients, and then the message will get multiplied by the G matrix. Okay? So we will get something of the form T bar, times g times m plus e for e with small coefficients, mod q, okay? So as in the usual regular style decryption, we can just round off this short error e, okay? And recall that t bar was equal to q divided by t, so it's large, so we can just round off the error. We are going to end up with something of the form t bar times g m, okay? So we can just divide it by t bar, to get something that only depends on the gadget vector and the message m, okay? And this will just be a polynomial in RT, okay? Recall that, so G is specifically constructed and M is binary. So this multiplication will make sure that this is a polynomial with coefficients that does not exceed T. Okay, so that's how we specifically constructed this gadget vector, okay? And in particular, the bits of the coefficients of this polynomial f will simply be representing the message, okay, due to the construction of this gadget matrix, which we can easily recover in decryption, okay? So that, this is how we do partial decryption uh, for this uh, HMC-based VPDC in our setting. And of course, this is not just all that we show in the paper. Uh, we extend this decryption method to work with relaxed uh, opening proofs. And in particular, we make use of our generalized decryption feasibility results to uh, do the formal analysis of this extension. And then we formally prove the aforementioned EPDC properties like this soundness against relaxed proofs and the succinctness property that we discussed before. And we also have a more generalized decryption algorithm 
that the message does not need to be binary necessarily. It still needs to be short relative to Q, the modulus system modulus Q, but it doesn't have to be binary. Okay, so as the last part, let's discuss about our matrix AU application, which will be an auditable version of this matrix protocol. And for this, let us first recall how this matrix protocol worked. Very briefly, I'm not going to get into the technical details at all. So this matrix protocol is a private blockchain payment protocol that is based on the so-called Ring CT approach. And this Ring CT approach is used in Monero cryptocurrency that I mentioned before. And matrix is a lattice based instantiation of this Ring CT framework. And it hides the payer and payee identities and the transaction amount. And then uh, in particular, to hide the real payer among n users, it makes use of a ring signature or a one out of n NIST proof. Okay. And then in this one out of n proof, it uses an HMC commitment to encode the real payer's index that we can denote by L. Okay. And this encoding is just done by committing to the unary representation of L, which means that you just commit to a sequence of bits that represents this index L. And moreover, the same commitment also encodes the bits of the output amounts. Okay? And the reason that we are committing to the, these bits is to hide the transaction amount. Okay? So we have this one commitment that's encoding the user index as well as the transaction amount in binary format, okay? which exactly matches what we have just seen in our decryption uh, assumption. So the message was binary, and we assumed that the user was using an HMC commitment. Okay, And there is already an opening proof and well from this proof as part of this matrix protocol, Okay, which means that the protocol already proves that this commitment contains a bunch of uh, bits, and it is well formed. Okay. And this, then, Already the protocol has kind of like the, proof, the NISC proofs that we want to have as the matching NISC. So all we need to do is to replace this ordinary HMC user matrix with this VPDC, HMC based VPDC we already constructed uh, in the previous part. Okay. And then this will effectively extend the ring signature in matrix to an accountable ring signature or a group signature where an authority can decrypt or can de-anonymize users. Okay. And as I mentioned, we don't need to modify the NISC at all, uh, thanks to the, this VPDC properties like key indistinguishability and trapdoor binding and so on. And we only need to do very minor modifications to the protocol descriptions and as well as the protocol, uh, protocol parameters. And we can very efficiently run decryption for a bar, very large message space of more than 2 to the 128 elements. And we can also apply our techniques to the newer version of this matrix protocol that is called matrix plus. Okay, so that's a more efficient version of matrix. So we can apply, we can make that uh, protocol auditable as well, formally auditable. And we have nice uh, kind of like additional features in terms of auditability. Uh, for example, we can have multiple auditors that can audit the same transaction without revealing their individual trapdoors. Okay. And we can also allow each user to choose their own auditor, or some users may choose to be not audited at all. And we can also let the system enforce auditing so that people cannot avoid auditability. And in this case, we just need to uh, make sure that the verification checks that the non-auditable transactions fail in verification. And basically, this is just done by uh, checking this commitment key, whether it's the trapdoor one or the ordinary one. Okay. And here is a comparison of matrix and matrix AU in terms of communication. So this is for a different uh, anonymity levels and for different uh, number of inputs and outputs in the protocol. So we can look at the proof size first, and we see that in all the settings, there's a very little overhead, just about 3%. And in terms of the system parameters, the public key size remains exactly the same, 
and only one of the system moduli is increased by 2 bits, about 2 bits. Again, for computation, there is very little overhead. So the key gen and transaction gen and verification functions have very little overheads. And these new functions, trapdoor generation and audit, also one run very fast. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. So here is uh, some references that I mentioned uh, during the talk. And the full version of our work is available on IECR's ePrint that you can have a look. And the source code of this matrix AU application is also available in this link. And if you have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate to email me. Thank you.